Stu's popped it in the chat, but it's um, it's almost nine o'clock, but we do have a couple more short presentations for you. So I'm going to be talking to you about Operation Cetacean for just 10 minutes now. So I just put my video on so you can see me. I'm a human being. <laughs> hi, Carl. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Amanda. I can see your faces. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be chatting about my project, Operation Citation, for 10 minutes, then Carl's going to talk about a little project that we're working on for five. So, um, hi, I'm Laura. Nice to meet you all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, but I'm just going to turn my camera off so you don't have to stare at my bobbing head. And I'm just going to talk to you about Operation Citation for about 10 minutes. So let me just share my screen with you and find my presentation. Okay, so um, so just to officially introduce myself, if you don't know me already, I'm Laura and I'm co-founder and lead researcher of Operation Citation. So this is a growing research and conservation project based in Torbay, so I'm based in the same area as um, Sarah. And uh, we focus primarily on studying the harbour porpoises in the area and how anthropogenic factors such as marine vessel traffic impact this species. I've always been really passionate about ocean, the oceans and marine biology and since a very young age I've been fascinated by cetaceans. Um, I also have an honours degree in animal conservation science at the University of Plymouth and I actually recently qualified as a, a teacher. So. Um, that's just a little bit about me, but let's talk more about the project specifically. So in 2017, Stuart and I co-founded Operation Cetacean, um, and this kind of came from a research project that I did in my foundation degree at the University Centre South Devon. So I started off there and ended up at University of Plymouth. So this was a second year study, and I chose to study the harbour porpoise population in Torbay, but specifically from Berryhead in Brixham. And I did this for several months and basically fell head over heels in love with this very special species. My research for this project was really insightful and my results were really exciting. Um, so much so that I decided to run it and continue to study the porpoises in my own time. I even conducted my final year dissertation on them by expanding my study location to four different sites in Torbay. And it was in 2019 that I decided to make Operation Cetacean an official project by sharing it on social media and by calling for support from volunteers. I was soon joined by four other women who are incredibly passionate about marine biology and wildlife conservation. And my 2017 research project was published in the Ocean and Coastal Management Journal. So fast forward to today in 2021, and Operation Cetacean is now a group of 18 people all working together towards a common goal to understand as much as possible about our local population of little poor voices. So if you've ever visited Torbay, you'll probably agree that it's a beautiful place, but it's not just special because it's aesthetically pleasing. So what makes Torbay so special? If you look at the illustration on the screen, you can see that it's a C-shaped kind of bay and it's very sheltered from the elements. There are many valuable habitats within the bay, including seagrass meadows, and there's a variety of substrate types, including sand, mud, rock, and the seabed, uh, the seabed has a, a variety of depths. The seafloor is also very varied and the bay has a variety of headlands, including Hope Snows, Thatcher's Point, Ferry Head and Sharpen Point and all four of those locations are actually what I, I did my dissertation on. So all these features together make Torbay very attractive for a variety of species, including marine mammals like the harbour porpoise, sharks and a variety of fishes. And Torbay also has its very own marine conservation zone, which was established in 2013. And it actually protects a variety of features, some of which include sediments, peat, peacock's tail seaweed, native oysters, and the long snouted seahorse, which I think is another really special creature. So who doesn't love cetaceans? They're beautiful, they're charismatic, and they're intelligent. 
And there's approximately 90 species of whale, dolphins and porpoises worldwide. Although many studies focus primarily on the impacts of marine traffic on harbour porpoises, cetaceans in general as a family are threatened by a variety of factors. Some of these include noise pollution, which confuses the cetaceans, and may ultimately end up in mass strandings, which I'm sure many of you would have seen on the television at any given point. More and more marine vessels are utilizing our waters globally, which can strike the whales and dolphins, and propellers can leave horrific scarring and cause mortality upon impact. Pollution such as microplastics make their way up the food chain and chemical toxicity can negatively affect growth, fitness, and eventually cause mortality. So what is a harbour porpoise specifically? There are, they are our most frequently cited cetacean in the UK and Europe. They are protected from disturbance and endangerment by the Wildlife and Countryside Act. And according to the IUCN Red List, they are a vulnerable species in Europe. In addition to being our most common cetacean, the harbour porpoise is our smallest cetacean, growing to only 1.5 metres, um, maximum of 2 metres in length. They grow to weigh about 65 kilograms and they can actually live to be 24 years of age. So harbour porpoises are sentinel species. Marine mammals are often used as sentinel species when monitoring aquatic ecosystems, as they're usually positioned at the top of the food chain, and they're relatively long-lived and are highly mobile. The overall health status of a sentinel species can reflect the health of the ecosystem they reside within, making them of great value to scientific research. So put in simple terms, if there were marine mammals such as the harbour porpoise using an area frequently, and now they're not, this could be a strong indicator of a failing ecosystem. Therefore, monitoring species like the porpoise, dolphins and seals is super important, important to um, management and conservation efforts. So in the summer of 2017, so that initial project um, that I conducted, I spent three months observing the harbour porpoises in the waters off Berry Head. Each watch I conducted lasted between two to four hours and observations were conducted during daylight hours ensuring a wide range and of activity periods and of course good visibility. My observations consisted of 15 minute watch periods. For each 15 minute interval, I would log all of the marine vessels in the area at that time. As soon as a porpoise would appear, I would record all the surface behaviours that I saw and take note of any environmental factors, including tidal state, swell height and sea state. I used a record form adapted from the Sea-Watch Foundation land-based effort form, which is readily available online if you want to look at that. And during my studies, I would log the boat type and whether it was moving or stationary. I was able to identify each behaviour as it was happening with the use of the ephragam that you can see on the screen. And the behaviours that I studied included travelling, resting, feeding, socialising and leaping. And it's important to note that I recorded only surface behaviours because I can't get in the water with the porpoises. That would definitely influence the data. Um, I just don't think I'd want to do that anyway. I don't think I'd be very happy if I got in with them. And by the end of the study window, I had completed 146 land-based observations with 185 occurrences of harbour porpoises and a total of 1,379 marine vessels. So now, four years later, we continue to use a very similar method for our research, and we've recorded porpoises in the waters off Berry Head during every month of the year. We have also recorded mothers and calves in the area on several occasions. Results from both our 2017 and 2018 research tells us that the harbour porpoises of Tor Bay spent over 88% of their time feeding, a behaviour that's incredibly important to this species as they have a high energy output and must feed continuously to avoid hypothermia and starvation. So if you don't know already, I don't want to, I don't want you to suck, um, I don't want you to think that I'm telling you to suck eggs, but hypothermia is getting too cold, basically. 
A key result from our research shows that as marine vessel frequency increases in the waters of Berry Head, fewer porpoises are recorded in the area and feeding behaviour reduces. Uh, if you would like to read this in much more detail, you can actually find this in the Ocean and Coastal Management Journal. And I'll, um, I've got the title, full title of it on one of my other slides. It's quite long, so I'm not going to say it out loud right now. <laughs> um, we've also found that tidal state plays a role in porpoise presence. So in our 2018 study, we found that harbour porpoises are more likely to occur during periods of low slack. Now, low slack is one and a half hours either side of low tide. So, for example, if low tide is at 3 p.m., low slack is between 1.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Now, we don't know exactly why this is yet, but we continue to study these factors and speculate that it's linked to prey availability during these times, but it may also be related to boat frequency as well. So while we know much more than we did when we started our research in 2017, there are still so many unanswered questions that I'm desperate to answer about these, this species. I want to know where they go when they're not in the bay. I want to know how big the population is. I want to know what other factors are impacting their health, their fitness and survival. I also want to know if and how pollutants are impacting poor boys health. I'd like to know where they, where they um, why they use berry head at certain times of day and during specific tidal states. And I really want to know exactly what it is that they're eating down there. So these are just a few of many thoughts that run through my head on a daily basis. And I'm constantly thinking up new ways to answer all of these questions. So unfortunately, I don't have enough time this evening to go into great detail about our past, present and future projects and their results. But I just want to take a couple of moments to share some projects that we're working on at the moment. So I never plan on stopping the study of how marine vessels impact harbour porpoises. So this is something that myself and my volunteers record regularly on Berry Head. This really is the bread and butter of the project and the foundation of what we do. Last summer, we went out on um, out we sent out, sorry, a survey to boat users with the intent to gain insight into the knowledge of the wildlife legislation and code of conduct. She will be providing an overview of this very shortly. Um, we actually recently relaunched this survey a few weeks ago and hopefully we'll get a lot more submissions to add to our research. We also collect photographs of the porpoises in Tor Bay so that we can log their dorsal fins and eventually identify individual animals. This will allow us to establish if the porpoises in the area are truly resident and will also help us learn where they go when they're not off Berry Head. So this project specifically is very challenging as porpoises are really small, they're really fast and their colouring is kind of non-descriptive. Non they're basically grey all over, so it is very challenging. Um, but I love a challenge and I'm going to keep at it. But hopefully, in the long term, we'll have some really interesting and, and kind of groundbreaking results there. So we also record dead cetaceans that are washed up along our coastline. And in a few weeks time, me and one of my volunteers will be doing the British Divers Marine Life Rescue Marine Mammal Medic course. So I'll be joining Sarah and her crew eventually as a, as a trained um, British Marine, uh, British Divers Marine Life Rescue, and I, I agree with you, Sarah, it's an absolute mouthful saying that. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'll be able to actively, physically save cetaceans and other marine mammals from, from difficult times, basically. Um, we also have many other projects on the back burner, such as hydrophone data collection and various surveys we plan on running. So please ensure to keep an eye out on our social media pages for updates. And you can find us on all of these social media platforms. So if you want to watch some videos about day in the life of a marine biologist, for example, you can go onto the Conservation Chat UK YouTube. And then we've got all of the, uh, the usual platforms, all at Operation Cetaceans. 